Good evening, everybody. We're looking at Chapter 7 tonight. The topic is navigation. The neat thing about working in a .NET environment is all the tools that we have available to us when we're building our websites that help to actually create some really cool navigation structures and uh, effects, even, uh, as a result of those structures. A lot of different ways to navigate through a website. One of the most primitive ways, honestly, is just using a regular old link. Right? You can just create a link from page to page. And uh, just because ASP.NET's got all these tools built in that can create fancy menus for you very quickly, doesn't mean that you have to do it that way. There's no rule that says that you should. Um, however, there's reasons why we do use the tools. You know, once again, accelerated development is one of them. Uh, if you use tools that automatically build menus, as you're going to see, you can add pages, and the pages automatically get added to the menu structure. That's kind of a neat thing that you don't have to go back and hand code things in. Um, but you know, what you're going to do is really going to be dictated very much by like the scope of what you're doing. You know, if it's a really big website, letting it automatically generate menus and site maps and things like that is is a good thing. Uh, because otherwise it would be too complex and easy to make mistakes. If it's a simple site, you can very easily argue that we I have no need for this. This just complicates it. And that will be on you as a designer to make that choice. Uh, the reason I mention this is as you start to work on your personal projects, you guys really are going to run into these situations where you're going to be making choices of how you're going to do things. And there's no right or wrong. Because I don't say you must do this or you must do that, a little bit of creativity comes into the mix. So keep that in your head as you're working. Now, in ASP.NET, we have a few different tools available, and I have them highlighted there in yellow. And they're basically pre-built pre tools that we can just pull into the project. Uh, the one is the menu, the tree view, and the sitemap path. And they can all be leveraged to build some of these components automatically by virtue of, of what we call controls. Really, the kind of the key to any site and its navigation is the logic that you've put in to organizing things. If you think of like a typical website, very often you'll have a key number of main pages. You know, so just imagine, right? We have a home page. We might have a a contact page, an about page, a gallery page, that type of thing. But if you have significant content on your site, you start finding the need to categorize things you know, logically. So for example, if I was selling products, and I was, let's say, selling uh, computer products and clothing, it would make a lot of sense to have two separate sections of a website, and then for computer products and for clothing, there would be subcategories for each that would logically form just by the nature of the very thing that we're dealing with. So that's kind of your first step. If you can you know, logically organize things you know, ahead of time, plan it out, what pages are you going to have, how are they going to attach to each other, Is, does this belong with that? That will help you significantly. Now, uh, the one thing that the author is pointing out right off the bat here is, you know, don't overlook just using a plain old hyperlink, which is where I started with you guys as well. So you can use very simple links from page to page using what we call relative URLs. So for, for example, here, we'd be linking to the login page. And since that page might happen to be in the same folder with the file that we're working with. We just call upon the file. And that's basic HTML stuff you guys should already know. If not, a little bit of a refresher. You can also use uh, the ASP uh, server side tags where you can create a hyperlink using this, which would turn into a regular looking hyperlink like the one that we see here after the server renders it. But this, in essence, would do the same thing. We're just using ASP tags to generate the hyperlink instead of hard coding it. Now, I'd like to think that all of you understand what a relative URL is. Whenever we say relative, 
we mean relative to the location of the file that contains the link. So if I have a web page and I want to link to a different web page, I have to know the file path on how to get to that other file. We saw the simple example, we're in the same folder, you just list the other file. But what if it's not in the same folder? And that happens pretty often in this sort of an environment where I might happen to have a folder like what he has, like a management folder, and then inside there I have a reviews folder, and then I have my page. But then I want to create a, a link to this file, which is one level above. Notice how they both have the same name? That is not actually unusual. That's, that's actually a technique that people use. When we do HTML or PHP, a lot of people will always put an index uh, PHP or HTML in the root of whatever folder they're working in. Same thing happens in ASP.NET. But in order to be able to navigate from one file to another, very often sometimes you'll have to go up a folder level first. If I happen to be in the root, if I happen to be here in this file, the default file, and I wanted to get to this file, which is inside the management folder, I would just say folder name, file name. If I want to find a resource that isn't in the same folder because I'm one folder deep already, so let's say I'm in this default file here and I want to get to an image, the way I would get to an image is I have to go up a folder level to the root, then find the images folder, then find the file, and that's what this dot dot slash is about. That just says go up first and then look for this path. It goes all the way up one level. If we were four levels deep, it wouldn't take us to the root. It would take us up one folder level. Yep, I'm about to show you that. <laughs> so, I mean, the one way you could is you could actually do what they're doing here is you just keep doing dot dot slash, dot dot slash, dot dot slash, dot dot slash. It's four levels up. Then you look for the images folder. Then you look for the file. However, we do have this approach as well, and a lot of people that work with web pages, um, frankly, aren't aware of this approach. Um, but this really lends itself from the structure of a, a Linux or Unix file system, because that's how those file systems work. When we precede a path with a slash, a forward slash, that indicates that we're navigating from the root of the file system. So in this case, regardless of where I'm putting this link and how many layers deep it is inside of a folder, that would start right from the root and take us to the management folder and to that file directly. So that, I'm hoping that answers your question. You can do the same thing with a tool that server-side controls give us, and that is you know, if we're running, let's say, an ASP tag, and we're looking for a particular file, look at this little character here. That does basically the same thing that we were just doing, putting us in the root and navigating from there. You can also, and it tells us here, you can also use it uh, on regular HTML links. But this does require some processing on the server side in order for it to work properly. So that's one thing you want to be careful of. The, the example that they give here, and I, I don't mean to gloss over it, is when you first learn how to create web pages, you learn to kind of put everything in the root of the site and, and build from there. Right? So when somebody wants to visit your website, they type in your .com address or whatever it is, they land in the root of the site, and the site says, aha, here's my index file or my default ASPX file. Okay, get going. But sometimes we create applications where the page that we want to start with isn't in the root. And ASP.NET allows you to do that. In fact, you can declare a start page that's anywhere in your folder structure. In fact, you might have the whole website in a separate folder. 
This allows you to identify what you consider the root of your site by definition. So you would actually set a start page, and then this would realize where that start page is. It might be in the root folder. It might be a few folders deep somewhere else. And then it considers that the root of the site for navigation. So it's based upon the fact that you have a specified starting point that may or may not be in the root of the site. Now one fail safe that always works is the fact that you can use an absolute URL which includes the, the protocol HTTP or HTTPS indicating that you have a finite spot on the internet that you're directly navigating to. Nothing's relative about it. If you're connecting to an outside resource, something that's not part of your website, you have to do that. But there are sometimes circumstances where you might give a, a finite URL or absolute URL within your own site, especially if you encounter a problem and you're not sure how to fix it. When I was younger and I was first, you know, doing a lot of freelance work, I'd work with, you know, systems like WordPress, for example, and I'd run into that issue all the time, and then I'd, you know, I figured out, well, I can hard code the full URL, I know that works, and that's what I did. It made it work. The only problem with that is, is if your links are dynamically generated and you change something, they don't update. So then, you, then you're stuck going back manually and fixing it all. Not that that's necessarily a pain, it just depends on the structure of your site. All right, so here, uh, this is what I was referring to, basically, the whole concept of uh, default documents. So we might run the website right off the root of the folder structure. We might run it within a folder. Uh, and we can declare, pretty simply, uh, to make a page a start page. You, it's as simple as a right click. Right click, set a start page. All right, so let's start talking about the navigation controls and just get a real quick little glimpse of what these look like. And chances are, because these are controls that are built into this environment, you've probably seen structures like this on web pages. You know, because very, very frankly, they look good without doing hardly anything to them, even if you just use them in this simple structure. So on the far left, you see the sitemap path. That, that's basically the breadcrumb trail that we were talking about just a little bit earlier. The tree view, and notice the tree view's got little expander boxes showing that we have a hierarchy. So for example, home, reviews, gig picks, about, login, those are all top level pages. And it just so happens that reviews has a couple of sub structures, you know, pages, whatever you want to call them, logical entities, and they become attached to it that way. Now, the fact that it becomes part of a tree also kind of allows us to use that structure to create drop-down menus, which is one of the things that they do in this chapter. And it's done very easily. If, you, if you've ever sat down and tried to create a drop-down menu using CSS or, or JavaScript, it's not an easy process when you're doing it manually. No. <laughs> um, it can be quite challenging if you don't follow certain techniques. So one thing that's neat here is when you watch the tool create a structure like this and then you go to your browser and do a view source and take a look at the code it's generating, it'll show you some good structure for, for accomplishing it even if you were to hand code it. So you can kind of borrow from the techniques that it automatically generates. All right, and then there's, there's this menu approach, and that is the one that I believe we start with, if I remember right. All right, every ASP.NET website will, if done well, will have a web sitemap file. Um, I have not opened up my project yet, but I'm going to go ahead and do that. I did beforehand make a, uh, a copy of the completed version of chapter six. So um, I have a, a fresh starting point here. 
I'm going to go ahead and open that site. Get rid of this little server explorer here. Give this a second to open. All right, you can see there's a bunch of files already open from the last time I was working in here. Um, but we will be creating that file, and then that will help us to have a structure to work from. And I'm, I'm just collapsing everything down so it's nice and neat to look at. Actually, it's probably not a bad idea. I'm going to go ahead and actually close all the pages as well. Okay, so they have an example here of a sitemap file and you can see from the first line that it's a, it's a type of file called an XML file. Now we talked about that, or you should have talked about that in your HTML classes knowing that XML files are really kind of the parent markup language for creating HTML even. And a lot of the configuration files inside of programs will often use an XML format. What XML allows us to do is to create our own tags, but as you can imagine, for sitemap files, there are certain standard conventions that Microsoft uses uh, for their development environment. And in essence, this creates a hierarchy. So we'll have like a global sitemap. So you see an opening sitemap tag and a closing one. Then there'll be a node. And then it, inside there, there'll be subnodes. So we're actually right inside the XML file. We're creating that hierarchy and, and structure. So this is something that you can do manually and pre-configure an entire site even before you build it if you wanted to, if you had that, that vision to it. That's not always how we do it. So um, one thing that'll end up happening is you'll see that uh, you can add stuff as you go, and that, that's pretty helpful. All right, there's um, a lot to learn here, so let's get started on the first exercise. All right, I'm going to bring up Visual Studio. I already have the site open. I'm hoping you guys are in the same spot. And I'm going to move the uh, instructions off to the second screen here while we're working. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to right click the root of the site, and we're going to choose add, and then add new item. And the thing that we are going to create is a site now. So the question is, where do I find that? It's not on my list, is it? Oh, it sure is. In fact, you guys need to get into this habit, if you can, of just typing in a search. Because it'll, it'll filter everything down, and you don't often think to do that when you're first you know, new to this tool. But in this case, uh, we can choose a sitemap. We are going to use C Sharp. Truth is, you could pick either one, and it would still work just fine, because uh, it's an XML file anyhow. But make sure it's C Sharp. Notice it pre-generates a name, just like what the book shows. Go ahead and click Add. And then you can see, right down here in the root of the site, it added a sitemap file. Now. It didn't really put anything in there, did it? It just created kind of the structure, the skeleton of it. But it, but the structure is there. So it basically gives you an example. And now what we're going to do is add our own stuff to it. Now, in step two, it says modify the, the file so it contains this code. So I am going to start doing a little copy pasting. And from what I'm seeing, 
these lines, and I'm looking at the book now on my second screen, these lines can stay just the way they are. And then basically everything that's going to be below that point and basically in between the closing tag, tags, plural, um, will need to be replaced. So I'm going to be doing that in increments. So I'm grabbing the code. So as I first start to paste it in, it, it is going to come in broken. And there is the rest of it. But let's take a look at it as we're working here. Now, the way that they have it formatted in the book, they're, they're throwing line breaks in, in you know, what I'll say is for me is an uncomfortable spot. So what I'm doing right now is I'm, I'm going through and I'm cleaning those up. And even though it might be a little bit harder to see on the screen for you guys here in the classroom, it does create a more organized appearance and it's easier to see the structure. You do not have to clean up the code like this. Visual Studio does not care how pretty it looks behind the scenes, as long as it works. All right, and then the next thing I'm checking here, I'm going to save it. You can see that on the sidebar how the kind of the on the fly debugger is not picking up any syntax errors. But you can see right from the beginning, and this is the point from here to here that we made our edits. Notice that we have this little symbol right here that says that's the root of our application. Home page has a description. And then from there, we start building the menu, and then it starts listing individual pages. So for example, home is default. Reviews is in the reviews folder called default, and so forth. Then notice that this little hierarchy here we have a couple items that are indented. Those would be logical subordinates to that main one. So we're not only setting up the menu items, but we're setting up the, the hierarchy as well. Okay, make sure you save the file. And can I give you guys a, a handy tip if you haven't figured it out yet? The textbook is located in the, on the resources page of our, of our Blackboard shell. You can go in and copy and paste the code in just the way I did. Or if you want, you can get the source code that comes with the book and pull the code from that file directly. The point is, I don't want to see you typing this all in manually only to discover that you typed one character wrong that breaks the whole darn application. Yeah, I suppose you do have to learn somehow. So here, I'll, I'll break it intentionally and save it. It doesn't really show that it's all that broken, does it? In fact, this turned green, but right here I do have an underline. Really easy to miss. I do have a little red mark here. That's really easy to miss too, but when I do go to launch the application, it would cause problems for me. All right, I'm going to pull my uh, book back onto the screen here and just start uh, looking at this next section. The first menu control that we're going to look at is what they call the menu control. And you're going to see that the menu control has a lot of different properties that are going to be attached to it. I'm not going to talk about each one in detail, but you, I think you can get the, uh, the idea just from a real quick read here. So the menu control will have a bunch of properties that we can leverage. Remember that any property that is listed for any you know, entity on a page can be programmatically controlled. So keep that in mind as well. 
So a lot of times, you know, you don't think about that as a, as a possibility, but that is something we can control through code. Um, so there's a bunch of different uh, properties that we can leverage. And probably the best way to do it is to see it in action. So let's give this a try. So they want us to open up the master page and markup view and find the nav element. So I'm going to go to the master page. And here is our nav element right here. First thing they want us to do is replace the text inside that nav element like this. Take a look at the little bit of code that we dropped in. It is a standard ASP style tag. And notice it's a special type that calls upon a menu as a control. And we learned about server controls. And I think next chapter is about user controls. Same basic type of construct. But in other words, this is something that will be programmatically generated automatically. The server will run this code, and then it will go to the sitemap file. And based upon that sitemap file, generate a menu structure automatically. And then when we run this page in the browser, and we come back and we do that view source, you're going to see generated inside those nav tags everything that creates the menu. And in this case, I believe it's going to be a, a series of uh, unordered list items that are nested in various ways. They also want us to go ahead and take this element here and they want us to set the CSS class. All right. They want us to make sure that it's set to, to main menu. Now, we copy and pasted it in, but if you didn't do this, uh, we wouldn't be able to attach our styling. Now, of course, when this renders the CSS class attribute, that will become just a regular class equals main menu, and then that's our connection to the style sheet. They do want us to switch over to design view. And it says, you may notice it doesn't look like the final page anymore. Why? It says that's because you may have removed the style sheet theme attribute from the pages element in web config. Did you guys do that? Why did you do that? Yeah, I told you to, of course. Well, because you guys are also playing with the theme switcher, too, right? So you're letting the theme switcher do the work. All right, it's telling us we can basically leave that alone for right now. And, and what their point is, ultimately, is if this does look like a styled version of the page, you do need to go in there and you have to remove that pages attribute from the web con config file. Okay, just, just be aware of that. All right, so they want us to go ahead and, and click this little arrow now to open the task panel. And we want to choose a data source. And then we want to choose new data source. And then what do you guys suppose we should select here? Yeah, sitemap. All right, so they're saying when you return to the page, now it should show your top level item in the menu automatically. Because that's what that structure does. They said the next command, and these are where like you got to be really careful with the steps. You know, like if you errantly click, it can kind of throw you off a little bit. It says, click the sitemap data source control once, and then press F4 to open or activate the properties grid. But just clicking on it once does activate the properties grid here. 
right? But sometimes people do turn that off, so that's kind of the point there. So what we want to do here is we want to change the starting node property. And here's where I'm going to switch to. I'm already on it. Okay. So click it and change from true to false. And basically instead of showing the home page, we are now showing all the top level pages just by making that little switch. So that was show starting node. Switch it back to true. It gives us just home. If I switch that back over to false, it will show all the top level menus. All right. They also want us to go back and click on the control one more time. And it says, click the menu control once to select it and make the following changes. So we want to change some properties. The first property is uh, static enable default pop-out image. All right, now notice I clicked up on the top here. And just to give you the differentiation, this shows the source of that file. This is the actual menu. So they want the menu to be the item that's selected. So I found the static enabled default pop-out image, and I'm setting it to false. The orientation needs to be set to horizontal. And that's one of those things I think you'll be appreciative of. Once again, if you've ever hand-coded a horizontal menu with drop-downs in the past, if you've ever done that manually, JavaScript, CSS, however you did it, it's quite a pain to take something that's in an unordered list, which by default are block-level list items that all want to appear one after each other, top to bottom, and you're taking them and making them behave like inline elements so they go horizontal. And here we just have a switch and boom, it's all done for you automatically. It's a, it's a wonderful thing, it really is. All right. Go ahead, take a look at your code. And this is the resulting output. Notice that we do have an ASP tag for the menu. We also have the link to that sitemap file. And that's done here automatically. So go ahead and click your Save All button, save everything. Hit the Play button. Let's see what happens in the browser. All right, I'm coming up in dark gray. The book's coming up in monochrome, but there's monochrome. But notice our navigation area now has a menu. I hardly coded a thing. Additionally, there's already a drop-down. That's not very pretty looking yet, I'll give you that. But it is there, and it looks like the links are all active. That's a significant amount of time saved. If you know what pages you're building, you can put them into a sitemap file, add a couple of simple controls, tweak a couple of settings, and you have a horizontal menu with very little effort. That works. If you do a right click and do a view source, let's just do that real quick. And then take a look at what's been generated here. Unordered list with list items. When we have uh, multiple levels, I'm trying to find one here, you'll find list items and in, in unordered list bedded inside of list items, and that's how they do the drop-downs. 
And I, we took a moment here in class to pause and try to discuss why some people's output is not looking the same. And I, I'm just trying to point out right now that even my output is not quite right compared to what's in the book. So the code that I have here I must have messed with a little bit because there's a lot of text that's read that really shouldn't be read. I'm not really too worried about it because that's, that's not really our, our focus here. But All right, let's uh, move on. The next section is about styling. And what it wants us to do is to go to the monochrome theme CSS file. So I'm going to open up the app themes folder, the monochrome, and then we're going to pull up the monochrome CSS. And they want us to add a few rules in here. And that, that is so that we can style the stuff that is in the drop downs. All right, so what they want us to do is add a few styles. So I'm going to bring them in incrementally here. And in terms of where you're going to place them, you know, most likely I'm going to drop them in right at the bottom. But then I'm noticing that there are menu items here, right, that were automatically created, I think. And then I'm scrolling down to see what else is on the page. So the way that I would do this is I would try to keep all the, the menu items in one area of the CSS file. So I don't have to be jumping around. So here's the first one I'm pasting in. And then I have several more. And then I'm going to do a format here just to make sure it looks nice. All right, and let's go back and take a look at those items that we just added. All right, so these items apparently were pre-styled, I'm assuming. And then we added level one UL, so we'll have to take a look and see what that is. Uh, when something is selected, something will become a different color. And this isn't a pseudo selector, folks. Like if you remember your, your advanced CSS skills, this is actually a class. So this is going to be a class that sits inside a UL with a class of level one. That's how that reads. Additionally, any of the things that are anchor tags within level one or level two will get a certain type of styling. So there's a little bit of padding in there, some, some background color. And then finally, we're adding a hover effect to both the level one and the level two anchor tags, where it's basically going to change the background color. So just from those, you know, simple read through will give you a little bit of an idea of what should happen on the page. And once you've made your changes, they're asking you to save it and close it. You can close it if you wish. It's not really all that necessary. All right. Next thing they're going to do, and I'm on step three, bottom of page 267. I'm just going to pull it back over. They want us to go through and they want us to create some folders. There's an about folder and a reviews folder, and then create some pages. All right, so it says, next create the following folders and web forms that you'll use in this and latter chapters. Use the My Base Page template to create the new files. And then it says, in markup view, give each page a meaningful title to avoid errors later. All right, so we got a little bit of work to do. So I'll get the process started, and then you guys can follow with me. All right? So let's start by making the folders. I'm going to make an About folder and a Reviews folder. I'm building those right off the root of the site. About. Reviews. Inside the About folder, I'm now going to add Add a new item. Now help guide me. How do I do my base page? 
Oh, sh should I search for it? Okay. Yeah, if I named it my base page, I should be able to find it. Yes, it, yeah, it does have my comment. This is my base page, duh. All right, I'm going to go ahead and uh, continue our work then since we, we found this. And the first uh, page I'm going to create is default. But where did it put it? Did it put it in the right spot? Oh, yeah, it did. That's because I did it in that location. All right, so let's uh, proceed. Uh, we'll do a contact and an about us inside there as well. So So the About folder is done. Now I'm going to move on to the Reviews folder. Do you guys notice that my base page is now on my quick list here? So I can actually kind of save a little bit of a step there. And the more you use something, the more apt it is to show on that list. Visual Studio does kind of learn what you do and uses it to save time. All right, so I went ahead and created all those. They did also want us to make sure that we change the titles to avoid problems. So what I'm doing is I'm going to come in here to each file and populate the title. So the first one's supposed to be about this site. Contact us. Oh, this should be about us. See? Got to be careful. That's a great visual effect. Some sort of a video glitch. I'm not really sure what causes it, or if it even ends up in the video, honestly. So the default page should say my favorite reviews. And then finally, all by genre. All right. Then go ahead and hit the Save All button. Make sure all the files get saved. Next step, it says Save All Changes and open the default page from the root in your browser. So this default, the one that's in the root of the site, so I'm going to right-click directly on that file and choose View in Browser. And now it says you, it should look a whole lot better. Mine doesn't look a whole lot better. Because they're assuming that my base page was complete. That's my problem. Yeah, so... If I take a look at the contents of that base page, I'm going to guess that I didn't have a link to the CSS file in there. So here's what I'm going to do, and I know this is kind of cumbersome. In the course shell, if you run into the same problem, I do have a copy of that file way at the bottom here that you can use. 
So what I'm going to have to do, and we are about to go on break here, is I am going to delete all the pages I just created, and I'll cover some, and then recreate them with that base page so that they work. Because I forgot that I never finished. All right, I have a few tips I'm going to mention before I continue uh, with the rest of the chapter. Um, the one thing is, is if for some reason your base page is messed up, go back to the to our uh, Unit 6 folder. At the very bottom, I have a working base page template file that you can download and insert into your project. Um, the location where you would put that would be in your Documents folder, Visual Studio, one would be My Exported Templates. You would put it here. If you already have one existing, delete it and replace it. The other spot would be under Templates and Item Templates, and you would also place it here, just in case you need to um, redo it. Another handy tip is if you were doing like I was doing, and I was like right-clicking, and after a while, you're just like doing this. And then you forgot to like type in a name, and you end up dropping into my base page ASPX. Um, instead of trying to tweak that file and, and correct it, because it really won't work right unless you fix these things also, what you really should do is just delete it and recreate it and give it the right name. That's that's better and safer than trying to to adjust the file itself. Another tip is if you go to launch. And for some reason, it does not pull up the right menus, because that's what just happened to me. Uh, it wasn't pulling up the right thing. I'm like, oh, great, the base page thing didn't work right again. Uh, the book has a little reminder. It says, common mistakes if you get an error when you navigate. Uh, and basically, I needed to do a hard refresh, which is pressing down on the Control key and F5. That just makes sure it clears the cache and it's actually reloading the page. Because one of the defaults that happens with websites is that your browser, depending on your browser, likes to just use whatever version it just used. And you have to force it to do a hard refresh. And that, once again, is holding down the control key in F5. And you, I usually press do it a couple of times just to make sure. If you really want to make extra sure, you can go into Visual Studio and instead of going to Google Chrome, you could go to a different browser and see what it looks like and just make sure that it's rendering. All right, let's, uh, let's move on now. And now we're going to go over to the section on uh, doing it with a tree view. So we're at the top of page 271. And it wants us to open up the master page in markup view, so you want to switch the source code down here. And it, and it says, just below the menu control, add a tree view control by dragging it from the toolbox. So if you cannot see your toolbox, click on the view menu and find toolbox on the list. And this tool is going to be under the navigation section. You can see tree view. And it says just below the menu control, add a tree view control by dragging it from the toolbox. So that's what I'm going to try to do here. And let's see if I put it in the right spot. So where would you guys think I should put it? Here? Here? That's right. That's what I would read as well. Because really what's going to happen is the sitemap data source is going to be the same for both of them. So I am going to pull that tree view in right to this spot. Visual Studio will take care of all the formatting for me. All right. It says within the opening and closing tags of this element, it wants us to copy the following code and add it. I'll do the, the indents manually here. God forbid. Now 
I would like to switch back over to design view. And you can see right away what it's doing with the, with the structure, the tree structure that it automatically begins uh, to build. You want us to click the little arrow again, choose a data source, and we can choose the one that we've already selected. And notice how it instantaneously pulls in the structure from the sitemap file without me doing much of anything. Now, not a big deal because we don't have that much, but can you imagine if you had like, you know, 50 pages, 100 pages? Your navigation might not be that complex, but just the, that capability of doing all that automatically with a click is very powerful. All right, the next thing they want us to do is for the tree view control, they want us to open the property window and set the show expand collapse to false. Now just to be really clear that the thing that we're doing right now, this menu structure is going to be in the left hand sidebar, left hand menu of the dark gray theme. And the horizontal one is going to appear on the monochrome theme. Right. In uh, step number five at the bottom of page 271, it says click somewhere in the document to put focus on it and then press F7 to open the code. So that what they're doing here is they're showing you that there's a shortcut way to get to the code view instead of clicking this button. Then I can just click anywhere on the document and then just press the F7 key, which I'm doing, which you can't see, but it takes me into the code view, not the source code for the document but the source code for the code behind file. That's the, co that's the code view they're, they're talking about, about. All right, so we need to do a little bit of an adjustment here. And there's going to be a spot right here at the bottom where we're going to add a little bit of, of code. All right, so I'm trying to locate the right spot in my code, and I'm, I am looking at the book here, so I'm trying to make sure that it goes in the right spot. So I want to get this switch statement right after the three curly brackets from item selected true. So use that as a visual cue. So one, two, three, and then right here. Now, a switch statement, if you remember, that's just a, kind of a fancy way to do an if statement. But basically, if we're changing to dark gray, it says that menu 1, which is the horizontal menu, will not be visible. Visible will be false. And then the tree view will be visible. Otherwise, the converse is true. And we could do that with an if-else statement, too, but I think they're trying to to show switch in action. All right, make sure that you save all your changes. And then let's take a look in the browser. So here we are in monochrome. Let's switch over to dark gray. Now you can see our expanded tree menu. And that was done automatically. That's pretty nice for not really a lot of work. All right, the last kind that we're going to try is doing the, the, the site map path approach uh, with, you know, that's basically generating a, a breadcrumb. So go ahead and jump back to Visual Studio, back to the master page. And I have so many pages open now, I think I'm going to start getting wise and close some of them. Not all of them, some of them. All right, so I'm on the front end master. And then it wants us to find the main content section. That looks like this right here, right? And then directly underneath that tag, they want us to add a sitemap path. So what's going to happen is in the content area itself, we're going to add the breadcrumb trail. So I'm going to 
just drop it in here. So you see sitemap path, we can just call it up, it's just an ASP tag. And then we're just going to do a control S to save. And it wants us to go ahead and, and uh, run it and see what happens. So let's go ahead and do that. In fact, let's do a, one of those Control F5s to refresh a few times. And what they really want us to do is they want us to start kind of clicking around and they want to see the breadcrumb trail change. And then you should notice that you can also use that to do your navigation. And it seems to be working okay. Let's switch over to the other theme and let's go a few layers deep. Let's move around. It all seems to work. All right, so that's a really quick little example of that uh, and pretty simple to implement. I mean, once you have that sitemap already generated, it's, it's a piece of cake. There's just one little line of code and it all works. Okay, since uh, those examples seemingly are working pretty well, uh, let's go back to Visual Studio. And we're going to learn about doing some redirects. And what's interesting about that is that we can control where the user ends up going, even if they didn't necessarily click on where they were thinking they were going, and they end up somewhere else. And that process is called a server-side redirect. So I'm not redirecting them with some code that I wrote on the client side, meaning in HTML or JavaScript. I'm doing it on the server, so some code is going to execute on the server, and then that is going to put you somewhere else. All right, so they want us at this point to go to the demos folder, so I'm kind of collapsing some of these other folders so we can see them. Uh, we want to create two new web forms based on our, our base page template, call them source and target. So I'm going to right-click, add my base page. First one's going to be called source. And target. You want us to set the titles for them. Target and source. Click and save all just to lock that in. They want us to open the source file in design view. And it says double click somewhere in the gray read only area. So where's the gray read only area? Like everywhere? I know it's read only because, like, like, see the not sign? <laughs> it means I can't really do anything. Read only area outside the content placeholder. Yeah, not in there. <laughs> you guys figured it out. <laughs> All right, then what we're going to do is we're going to add just a real snippet, small snippet of code here. Very simple little C-sharp code. Make sure to save it, so I'm going to control S here. Uh, then they also want us to open the target page, switch to design view, and it says add a label control. I mean, where do they want us to put it? Add a label control to the CP main content area, the only place we can add it, I suppose, right here. Uh, leave its ID set to label one and set up a page load handler similar to the one that you created previously. So once again, all we have to do for that is just double click anywhere on the page and then add this little line of code. So 
save your work. In fact, hit the Save All button, make sure everything is. And let's go ahead and launch the site. And I'm doing a Control F5 here, folks. Yeah, now what they want us to do is they do want us to launch what? The source file. So they want us to, to type in source.aspx. And what it's doing, are you noticing here? We're on the target page. So when we went to that source file, this code immediately took us over to that page. And then what you should start to identify whenever you see a question mark in a URL, that's indicative that we're doing a query as a get. A get means we're appending to the URL a query string that's visible in the, in the string. And what are we sending? Oh, some value. When we get to that target page and it loads up, that label that we added to the page is going to grab the query string that was being sent to it. So one reason that you might do a server-side redirect is if you want to push the user to a different page and send some data along programmatically. So that would be one reason. So I think of a lot of e-commerce reasons for, for making something like this happen. All right. I am now at the bottom of page 280, and we're working on the very last thing, which is the actual server-side redirect here. It says, open the code behind of the source file. So the source ASPX CS file. So if you were looking at it here, this is the one you want right there. This one here. And they want us to change the code that we added to this. And here, we're actually running a different form of code. So it, it's just showing that it's a different way to kind of accomplish the same thing using a, a different methodology. So I'm going to go ahead and save that. And we're going to try this again. And of course, it's taking us right to that file. Let's go to home. Let's go, where do we need to go to get there? If I need to type it in manually. Boy, I lost my browser now. There we are. We know we're in the demos folder, right? And there's source. And now we're on target. Did it work okay? Yeah, it worked just fine. Just in case you're wondering, it worked just fine. All right, folks, that wraps the chapter. And this video ends here.